Welcome to the podcast about venture capital, where investors and founders alike can learn how VCs make decisions and reach conviction. Your host is Nick Moran, and this is The Full Ratchet. Nadav Alat joins us today from San Francisco, and Oz Alan joins us today from Israel. Oz is co-founder and CEO of Unicorn Honeybook, the leading platform for independent businesses to manage their client flow and cash flow. The business has raised nearly $500 million in venture capital and provides tools for client communication, contracts, invoices, and payments all in one place. Inspired by his firsthand experience as a small business owner, Oz built HoneyBook to enable creative entrepreneurs to focus more on doing what they love and less on administrative tasks. Nadav is general partner at At Inc., an early stage venture firm that aims to invest at incorporation. Nadav's early investment strategy has also led to successful investments in Netlify, WeScover, Placer.ai, and more, along with early advisor roles at companies such as HoneyBook. Oz and Nadav, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you both. Nadav, you and I have known each other for some time. Oz, this is the first time we've had the pleasure to meet, but let's start with you, Oz. Can you tell us a bit about your background prior to HoneyBook? I like to say that I was born and then there was HoneyBook. HoneyBook was kind of my, my first job out of college. And it's not only my story, it's the story of my wife and mine together. We met when we were 16, or actually 13 years old. We started dating at the age of 16. And we did a lot of things together. And one of the things that we did over the years, we were the ones that host parties for all of our friends. So think about like hundreds of people came to our parties. And we loved these huge projects. In hindsight, you know, you can connect the dots and you can see that what we actually liked was creating great experiences. And late 20s, we both owned businesses. And as we were owning businesses and found ourselves interacting with other small businesses, we learned that small businesses were very outdated in the way they performed and communicated with their clients. And that's kind of what got us to to start HoneyBook, we want to serve as many service-based businesses as possible. We want to help them respond quickly to their clients and to accept online payments, which was, believe it or not, not a thing 10 years ago. And what were you doing in business that kind of allowed you to uncover some of these issues with managing a small business? At the time, I owned a bar in Tel Aviv, and that's a great business. <laughs> you get to meet so many amazing folks. In fact, our third co-founder, uh, Dror, I, I met him on, on the bar. He was a regular. Your kid. Yeah, and one night I, I asked him, hey, Rory, you know, how, how are you making the money we're taking away from you? So he said, well, I'm actually an engineer. And I was like, no way. We thought about this idea and maybe, and, you know, maybe we should meet and talk about it. And, you know, the rest was history. So I would meet great people every night. And, and I loved creating experiences. I loved serving customers. And again, I think that that's what, one, led us to, to do HoneyBook, but two, to fully appreciate and admire the fact that our members, uh, we call our customers members, our members, every one of them is a service-based business. They love serving. They love delighting. They love creating great experiences. We have web designers and interior designers and business coaches and photographers and, and you know, what they all have in common. They just love creating great experiences and serving their customers. Amazing. Well, I bet you've had a, a pretty good venue for some closed dinners and, and maybe some drinks too, Oz. <laughs> Nadav, can you share a bit about the history and thesis of At Inc? So I uh, started in 2015, actually called it uh, Tank Hill Ventures after the name of the hill next to my house in San Francisco. I've invested in 18 companies and actually committed as LP in eight funds. And we already have um, six multi-billion dollar businesses today in that portfolio. And uh, you mentioned HoneyBook as a, as a unicorn, but I like to talk about HoneyBook as a company that already crossed $100 million in revenues in ARR and, and growing. In 2021, I reached out to my 25-year-old friend, Ronnie Bonjak. We went to high school together, and then we actually we were in the university, Tel Aviv University together, and moved to Silicon Valley roughly at the same time to join me and actually building it as a firm and uh, scaling it. So we raised fund number two and we basically are running Ad Inc. So we rebranded it. We rebranded it from Tank Hill Ventures to Ad Inc because Tank Hill Ventures was nothing strategic in that name. It was just the name of a beautiful hill in San Francisco. And Ad Inc is very, very strategic for us. We like to partner uh, at incorporation with founders and support them from day one and all the way, similar to the way we supported HoneyBook and Netlify and Placer and others. We look to partner with the founders to work with them 
to build that close relationship and develop deep insight into what they're working on and to be able to evaluate and understand the challenges and the opportunities along the way. And we focus on the intersection of global and tech. So something that you can sell globally and it's technically not, not easy to do. It doesn't need to be deep tech, but it just needs to be technically not easy. And then we also find ourselves liking industries that are a little bit overlooked. So for example, we invest in a company called Shipping.ai that they're innovating in the maritime industry. And this is roughly who we are, right? Like we like to partner at the beginning, be there with the founders, go through the different iteration through product market fit, building foundations for hyper growth and support company throughout that lifetime. Awesome. Well, a true formation stage investor. That's kind of a rarity in today's market. You know, most people are requiring some traction. Nadav, can you talk about how you met Oz? Oh, yeah, definitely. So almost at the bar, but uh, not exactly. <laughs> the first serious conversation you and I ever had, yeah, it was on a bar. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was at your bar in Tel Aviv. That was this first serious conversation about Hanbuk. That's That's true. You're recruiting the engineers and you're recruiting the investors at the bar? <laughs> yeah, but actually Nadav is married to a childhood friend of mine, Meital, and they were dating at the time to each other for the first time in a cinema where we lived. And, you know, the first thing that came to mind is like, you know, seriously, you're dating this guy? <laughs> <laughs> but then when we had a serious conversation at the bar, I understood why. Yeah, and I think like the longest time we spent together back then was when you were at our wedding. Yep. Right, Oz? That's probably the longest time that we spent together back then. Were you guys jamming on, on HoneyBook at this point, or was, were you on other ideas before this? We were already thinking about HoneyBook at the time. You know, and I think one of the things that, you know, many people talk about the co-founding moment of a company and, and the incorporation, etc. But the reality is that most entrepreneurs dream about the idea for many, many years before it actually happens. So I'm absolutely certain we were talking about HoneyBook one way or another at the wedding as well. <laughs> and then Oz moved uh, to Silicon Valley roughly a year after we moved. And that's when we developed a closer, deeper relationship. Also over drinks at the bar, probably uh, roughly on a weekly basis, uh, we were talking about, like I was sharing with him what I've learned about those early days here when I moved to Silicon Valley, coming into this area and learning about it. And then Oz moved in with HoneyBook and that's how we can develop our closer relationship. We talk about these things. So we, we sat at the bar and, and Nadav was talking about Silicon Valley. They lived in Silicon Valley. And, you know, when you are an entrepreneur in Tel Aviv, so far from Silicon Valley, probably like more than 7,000 miles away, it sounds like a place you, you will never, ever get to, right? It's like this magical place that things happen and you will never get to. And I think it's interesting to see that we're living in a world now that entrepreneurs can really travel the world and, and start companies in far and, and amazing places like Silicon Valley. Tell me about that early experience, right? You moved to Silicon Valley, you finally got there, you got to this magical place. You know, I run this firm, New Stack, and our tagline is investing in outsiders, right? So here on the show, we're featuring unicorn founders that were outsiders, right? And in many cases, somewhere along the journey, they find themselves in the valley, whether they move there or they have to go out there to raise their Series B or Series C round. You know, what was, what was your early experience like moving out to the Bay Area? So first of all, I have to give the credit to, to, to some of our first investors. And at the time, it was, a, it was an accelerator named Upwest Labs. Now it's a fund. They invested and proposed that we will move to what I thought at the time was called Alto Palto. In hindsight, the real name was Palo Alto. <laughs> No matter what, we got to the right place. It was actually Menlo Park. But the first experience, first of all, getting together with people that you know from home. So Nadav, it was a critical relationship to slowly understand like what's going on, right? Understand how to communicate. Uh, what do people what do people expect? Probably it's different from, from what people expect in Israel. One thing that really stood out is that in Palo Alto or Silicon Valley, people really wanted it to help you and and almost no one was like unreachable people were reachable and i love that i fell in love completely with that mindset that people that you heard about them like they, these famous names suddenly are willing to take a meeting and to hear your story another thing that was very interesting at the time for me was Nama and i so again Nama was my, my co-founder is my co-founder we are married <laughs> happily married in israel investors did not think it's a plus to be a married couple as co-founders, right? But we ran into investors in Silicon Valley that thought it was great and saw it as a, as a pro and not a con. Interesting. You know, these experiences of the difference in culture. And lastly, I will say that you sit in front of investors 
that did very well and, and are very successful. You read about them in the media, and then they come to the meeting with this crappy car, and it's not what you would expect, right? And they walk into the meeting, and they sit with you, and they look at you, and they imagine the company you're going to build. They imagine your company with hundreds of employees and hundreds of millions in revenue. And the reality is that, you know, as entrepreneurs, we promise the moon, but do we actually believe that this company that at the time, there are three people in that company, right? The three co-founders is going to be hundreds of employees. Back then in Israel, I didn't run into a company that had hundreds of employees. But again, these investors that saw that before look at you and they can see that. I think this is so important that entrepreneurs get that belief from the investors that already saw this before. And that belief really helps kind of like refine your dream and the ability to dream big. And in Silicon Valley, you know, you can dream really big. 100%. It's funny, Ozzy, you know, I remember our first conversation at that bar in Tel Aviv, you were talking about that $50 million market cap that you're going after. And then uh, maybe a year later, after coming in with Upwest Labs and going through all of the training, if you will, as well, you were talking about the $50 billion uh, uh, business opportunity. And, and, and as time goes by, uh, talking about bigger and bigger opportunities, but seeing them and getting this kind of help from people that have done it already to imagine and dream that big. And Nadav, have you written the first check on this? Are you advising at this point? No, I, I was a uh, first employee at a startup, hacking my way into Silicon Valley as well, uh, helping wherever I can. I was connected with uh, the team at Apple Labs, who are amazing, and I was uh, trying to help whatever company that they were bringing in to share what I've learned about those early days. Similarly with HoneyBook, so it started with like you know a, a weekly beer, and then it uh, naturally developed to a formal advisory role in their company, and then over time for a personal check and multiple checks from the different funds. I didn't have a, a fund or anything at the time. Amazing. And then Oz, can you talk about like the initial instantiation of the product and like how did you get that first group of customers? It's a great question. It really evolved constantly. There's a thing that we thought we want to build. And then there's what actually happened in the end. We were just gravitating towards building software that will help these businesses manage their businesses. The one thing that really annoyed us was the fact that small businesses would ask for a check or cash, that kind of business would send you an agreement and ask you to print it. And, you know, at the time, fax, to send a fax back. We just couldn't believe it. And these were the things we really want to solve. We didn't know how we we're going to solve them, but we want to, we want to get rid of the, of those things. And we thought that as long as businesses are going to operate that way, they won't be as successful as they can be. So we had conversations with potential customers. And I remember going in, in San Francisco, kind of going to their houses and asking them questions, showing them mock-ups of our product. But one interesting thing was, I remember talking to this photographer in Treasure Island, and he was looking at the screen and he asked my wife and I, what are these military numbers? What do you mean? What is 1600? It's four o'clock. And what we didn't realize as Israelis is that Americans use 4 p.m. They don't write 1600, right? But we didn't know that. So... I think the initial conversations that we had was, and it's just it's such a small thing, but you know, if you don't know, like if this is the reason that someone didn't understand your product, then you don't make the right decisions. So these initial conversations with customers helped us kind of like change these things. But then there was another thing. We thought that we're going to build this, and it sounds weird, but a photo sharing app of where small businesses are going to be tagged and then people are going to find them and then they're going to communicate and then they will send a, a proposal and an agreement and accept online payment. Now, obviously, we just want to go after the proposal, the agreement, the online payment. We went like this, this very long route to get there. It made sense to us, but in reality, it didn't make sense to anyone else. And one day, it was an event planner, actually, that asked us, hey, like, can I just use the payment thing? And we looked at her and we said, what, do you want to use the payment without all the other stuff? And she's like, yeah. And I remember kind of driving back home and thinking, why are we building this entire thing if eventually what we actually want to do, we want to help them to communicate with their clients and transact money. And then I remember us sitting in a coffee shop, I think Venezia in um, Palo Alto. I remember this moment where we were looking at each other and saying, well, we're probably going to fail. But if we fail, and when we fail, what are we willing to fail for? For another photo sharing app? Or to really change the way that people, trend, like the way they transact money and communicate with it? And we were like, obviously, the transacting money, like 
we would fail for that. I don't want to fail for like a photo sharing app. And that was a decision. The next day it was like, this is what we're going to do. And we built the first product. We saw the first transaction go through and the rest is history. And in the doubt from your standpoint, you'd known Oz from the beginning, you'd seen iterations, you know, when did it, it feel like they had found product market fit to you? When did you start getting really excited? And, and what did you see as some of the biggest risks to HoneyBook in the early years? Yeah, I think that moment in time, I remember it also vividly that that decision that they made, like, and they were sitting and saying, hey, you know what, like, why don't we go and help them do what they asked for for us to do, right? Like to actually transact, actually make the payment. And if you think about those times, they were starting to become services like uh, Stripe and Plaid. And it was just the beginning of that, right? Like 2012, 2013, 14, 15. Those were the early days of all those services that were making it possible to do that. And I think even uh, HoneyBook were doing it manually at the beginning. When you say manually, I transacted, like I went into the bank account and sent money to customers. The first 1,734 transactions <laughs> were manually, actually on bill.com, like in the bank account, sending them, sending these transactions. Just before Stripe and, and like when it all started, right? right? Like, but you had those, I would say, tailwinds that helped you and other startups to do that. But with HoneyBook, what was special, and I think like from the very beginning, I think this was what the, the most interesting part, it was that HoneyBook was focused on the member, right? Like the what they call member, the customer, and the workflow that they needed and help them do that, right? Help build the partnership and the relationship directly with the customer and help them do whatever they needed to accomplish, right? Because those independent businesses are, if you think about it, they are operating in an area that they know best, right? If it's a graphic designer, or if it's a wedding planner or photographer or any type of service provider, they focus on their service. They don't want to deal with business related uh, workflows. They want that to be solved. And I think this alignment that HoneyBook had from the very beginning, but it evolved over time, and you can see it's kind of like tightening up and tightening it up over time. This was, in my mind, one of the biggest assets that HoneyBook has been building, this aligning themselves with their customers' faith, if you will, and solving all the business issues for them. And when you see that they have started transacting on HoneyBook, you understand, okay, there's a product market fit here, right? Like there's like cash moving hands. There's a really big uh, connection between HoneyBook and their members. And it's not only the transaction, right? HoneyBook, because they were focusing on the workflow and because they were focusing on the needs, the transaction is something that happens after the fact. But what's happening before that is the invoicing, right? But what's happening before the invoicing, it's all the interaction with their customers and, and trying to understand what are those needs for service providers, for independent businesses providing a service. There's a lot of the back and forth and interaction that happened before that, right? So this type of alignment has been from the very beginning, I think, something very special about HoneyBook and a big part of our thesis in supporting HoneyBook throughout the lifetime of the business. This point is very important, which Dov just said, because I think it's a good lesson for an entrepreneur out there when you think about your business model. And I know it's not always possible, but if you can align, create this business model where you're completely in alignment with the interests of your customer, your company is going to benefit. We build software, but we make our money on transactions. So it's actually, it means that when our members win, we win. When they lose, we lose. And in COVID, by the way, when, when we were at, our customers were at major risk. We knew that the only thing that matters for us is to help them survive. If they survive, we survive. So that was the only focus. We didn't care about anything else, but our customers have to survive. They have to succeed. So I think it's a great thing if you can have a business model that, that creates that alignment of interest. 100%. I mean, that, that non-elective churn, you know, if customers fail, then you still lose the business, even if they're not opting out, right? You know, when did you know that you had reached product market fit? Were there some key metrics or was there an inflection point that you knew that the business had reached product market fit? Product market fit, uh, it's, it's, it's a loose term, right? And it's probably a, a kind of a, a spectrum of what, what does it mean? It's not binary. Um, although I, I think Mark Andreessen talks about a binary, from a binary sense. But I think there's a level of product market fit. And when we look at our customers, we have so many different verticals. I talked about web designers, interior designers, business coaches, photographers, and there's different sizes of businesses. So the level of product market fit is different between them. And we're constantly 
on the journey to improve the product market fit in every one of these segments and verticals. So this is kind of a day in, day out work that we do every single day. That will be how I would think about it. I will say that today when we have customers that perform better from a logo churn perspective, dollar retention perspective, from activation, conversion, when we look at all these metrics together, we get a good sense of here is a group of folks that is big enough uh, to build a great business, right? And all these metrics give us an indication that we have a certain level of product market fit. Now we go to the next vertical and we say, what does it look like there? And how do we get it from here to here? Because now we have a benchmark. That's how, how we think about it. At the time that HoneyBook was founded in sort of those early years, SMB was not a super hot category. I'm based in Chicago. You know, companies like Groupon and Grubhub had success in the SMB world, but it was sort of a tricky category for a lot of uh, venture capitalists in the space at large. And I'm curious to hear from your standpoint, how do you lean into some of these categories that are not, you know, hot or trendy at the time that you invest, but you clearly project out that the business and the fundamentals are strong and, and these are areas that will become hotter and more attractive spaces over time. If you think about it, in the time that we invest, right, like we are at, at so early in the process, we're not a series B focused type of VC or growth or whatnot, right? Like at the point where you're focusing on growth, you already know that there's like the shared economy. The point in time that we are investing in is the point in time that we want to imagine the founders coming to us and tell us, you won't believe it. People are renting space in their house to other people. It's like you can need to imagine it together with the founders. You need to try to understand and connect to what is their vision? What are they seeing? And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to listen, to be open to the founders, to identify what has changed in the world, right? Like what do they see that has changed in the world and why it has changed, right? Like the founders of Netlify, they have coined the term Jamstack, right? Like they have identified, like Matt Billman, they even identified that the world has is changing from like dynamic website to static website. He has identified some change in the world and saw that coming. It's not something that that we see coming. It's not something that we can even imagine or, or decide, or these are the categories that we're looking at. We're coming in so early. So we're trying to listen to the founders, work with them, understand how they think about the world and what is it that they see that is changing the world, right? Like with HoneyBook, I think they had in their presentation multiple times, a slide that has the 80-20, right? Because I think you still have it. Like, how do you flip the world from... <laughs> transacting 90% or 80% of the time in cash to transacting online. The founders of Honeybook have identified that. The world has changed already, and now they are the best people to execute and help all of us, basically, bring all of us together to a new world. Yeah, I will add to that, as you was talking about it, it, it occurred to me that, no, I don't hate many things, but I do hate cash. <laughs> And my wife hates cash. And so for us, it was it was war on cash, right? So that slide was very precious to us. It was like, look, this is what people are doing. We absolutely have to change that. Mm -hmm. We're not alone, right? Like there's many other great companies that are fighting that war together with us, but and we're joining forces. But, you know, again, it's like that feeling from the inside that you really want to change something. I will give props to you, to Nadav, to the ability to kind of have a perspective and conviction on things, which I think is an, a crucial trait for an investor. I saw investors with conviction, investors without conviction, uh, you know, the ones that follow other investors with conviction. Nadav is, is in the category of investors with conviction. And it's extremely important for an entrepreneur to be surrounded by investors like that. One example that I like is that COVID hit, we were all very sad. And there was a high level of anxiety. It was hard for me to see how we're going to get out of this. But there were some early signs that our our members are resilient and they're figuring this out. And Adav saw that and he said, hey, you know, I, I want to invest $1.5 million. And I said to him, Nadav, you know, as a friend, I don't think you should do that. I wouldn't invest right now at HoneyBook. And Adav said, yes, exactly. That, that's why you're not an investor. And it panned out to be the best investment at HoneyBook. But again, I think great investors have this way. Yes, as Nadav, you said, it, like the entrepreneurs are going to imagine things, but the ability to have conviction around what the world is going to look like and then see how these things fit into that world. And I saw that firsthand. 
But it also came from the data that you guys were sharing and you were showing uh, some data from the product and from the insights that you have about the contracts being delayed. And you can start seeing that in the data information that is not necessarily projecting bad things about the future. It's all about the likelihoods, but how can you get a conviction about that likelihood about the future, right? Like you don't know what will happen, but you can start understanding stuff. Now, I would not have been able to understand that if I have not been so close with all, then he would have been sharing with me information and consulting all the time. It's a big part of that, right? Like uh, throughout many years, right? Like, and, and this is why like during uh, that very hard times, I was able to relatively quickly analyze information that comes from the company and the executive of the company in a way that helped me understand something about the world. But I think it's very, very crucial what for any founder um, to share information and to share thoughts with their investors as it happens. And I think this is kind of like one of Oz's superpowers. He doesn't share it only with me, he shares it with every single person that he meets. At times it could be like, oh, we're just like here with friends. Like, why are you talking about that, right? Like, but he cannot stop, right? He's in that war against the cash or whatever that would be. But it's a good thing, right? Like, because you don't know who are the people that will help you get to where you need to get. This is another important point. One point was around uh, building a business model that has alignment of interest, and the other was about investors with conviction. I think the point that now Nadav raised was around transparency and sharing information with others. I see many entrepreneurs at the beginning of the journey. I like to call it there in the NDA stage. They don't want to even share with you what they're working on. Say, hey, I'm working on something, and you're like, oh, great, what? And it's like, you know, it's in stealth. If you don't share information, you're not going to get the feedback, right? And what you want, you actually want to share it with everybody you can share it with so you can get that immediate feedback and iterate and, you know, build the right thing and not bark in a wrong tree. I will say about, about Nadav, it's true, yes, we share it with lots of people. But I do think that building a very strong relationship, obviously we're friends, so it's easier, but build a really good relationship with your investors where be extremely transparent. It's going to help the trust levels, right? And you can get the feedback. So I think that's that's important as well. You talked about this before, but part of this required a lot of patience, right? You needed consumer behavior, business behavior to change over time. And in a way, you are also creating some change in behavior. But that bears out in fundraising, right? We go through... Fast and furious cycles, we go through slower cycles. You've raised near, nearly 500 million. I suspect it was not just a smooth line up and to the right the whole way, especially with your comments on the pandemic. So could you share maybe some of the lesser known takeaways on fundraising and the financing process, things that you'd share with founders on sort of taking VC? So first of all, I think it's great to, to, to have conversations with investors, super smart people that have a good perspective on the market and can give you valuable feedback. So talking to investors at all times is a great idea. We had rounds that closed within three days and we had rounds that closed within three years. Like seriously, three years it took us to raise one round. You know, we started kind of like having like C1, C2, C3. We had C3.5. It's just, we had these things. What we learned over the years is you can raise $25,000, $25 million and $250 million and the amount doesn't matter. It's almost the same effort in a way. For the most part, it's hard. Entrepreneurs need to always prepare themselves to, this is going to be hard. Don't fall into the trap of, of kind of like what people are telling you that I just kind of opened my email inbox and, and, and I had like five term sheets land in within after I just thought about the idea in the shower. I don't think these things really happen, maybe in the year of 2021, but the year of 2021 is the anomaly. That's not how things work. So I think entrepreneurs need to prepare themselves for a very long journey. It's going to be hard raising money every single time. Sometimes it'll be easy and then, you know, just be happy about it and that's it. And then the other thing I will say, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, you always raise money. And I like to say to people that I never raise money, but I, I just do this every single day. Always have conversations with investors. When a good investor wants to invest, find a way to get them in. I hear people like, oh, we already closed the round. If it's a good investor, it's another great partner, another great fan. Like, find a way. I never regretted investors that joined us through this journey. We have many investors, and I'm super excited about all of them. Awesome. Nadav, you've seen this journey. It's been a long one. Uh, you've watched the business. You've known Oz well. Very few 
founders and businesses reach 100 million plus of, of revenue and in, in unicorn status. Are there any key takeaways or any characteristics you've distilled down on, on what makes Oz unique and why this has you know, worked out so well? Before that I've answered, sorry, I, I would just say honeybookers don't like to be referred as unicorns. We're not a unicorn. At best, we're a camel. You know, we, <laughs> we, go, like that. Yeah. we go long distance. Yeah, I will actually give the credit to Yoni Adiri, another Israeli CEO, for, for coining that camel idea. But That's I, right, I yeah. liked it, resonated with that. How did we reach that camel status, Nadav? <laughs> Oz, is a, Oz knows how to ride camels since he was a, a, young, a young boy in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely what I mentioned before, right? Oz kind of like and his personality and the way that he engaged people with transparency and conversations and the ability to kind of like engage every single person that he is encountering with, engaging them with Honeybook, right? He doesn't engage them with his relationship, he's engaging them with Honeybook in some way, in a way that is working for Honeybook in so many different uh, directions, in hiring employees, in introducing some of the best people, a, a mutual uh, friend of ours who was engaged with Honeybook in a very <laughs> good way, has introduced Oz to, I think, one of the most strategic hires they had in the company. And that person was, you know, someone that you could not imagine hiring as an Israeli coming into Silicon Valley with all the titles of the Harvards and whatnot. And you were like, how can I even approach someone like that? But I think like Oz is engaging people who were with him in the class and these people who are doesn't have anything to do with Honeybook are kind of like connecting them directly to Honeybook. And, are, and it seems like he's g- getting everyone around him to work for Honeybook. So I think this is very, very specific character of Oz specifically. But I think this is something that we're looking for in a lot of the founders that we back. I think also another thing, and this is definitely something that we described when we're looking for, is we are looking for founders who are willing and able to learn and change super, super fun, learn super fast and change super fast. And this is something that I think Oz is and Honeybook as a, as, a, as a team is very, very good at. There are some people who are learning all the time but are not changing. It doesn't help you get anywhere. For some people, they keep on changing but without the learning. It's just super, super hard to learn and change all the time super fast. And sometimes you learn and change but not fast enough, right? But with startups, you really need to learn and change really fast. And I think this is another characteristic that Oz has ingrained in him. Uh, what do you need to do to, to reach the next level of high velocity growth? For us, we need to figure out how to expand internationally. And it's something we didn't do yet. We're only in the US. That's the first thing. Another thing is just keep being obsessed about the user experience and creating a really good experience for the right customers. And it sounds kind of like straightforward. Obviously, every company needs to do that. But it's a, it's a constant battle. You always need to learn who is your best customer and how to reach them. It's complicated and it's just it's an ongoing thing that we do. And then developing more products on the financial side. Our members use us to manage their clients. Their clients is the most important thing for their business. And then the second most important thing is money. They do their client flow with us and their cash flow. And there's a lot more value that we can create for that cash flow. And we're looking forward to do that because that will really open many opportunities for our members and for our business. For either of you guys, if we could feature anyone here on the show, who do you think we should interview and what topic would you like to hear them speak about? I think I, both uh, Gil Benarty from Upwest Labs is a super interesting uh, person to learn a lot from, especially for outside people who come outside of Silicon Valley and what does what does it mean to come from outside Silicon Valley to Silicon Valley, as well as I would say Ron McCovey, who um, sold the company to Facebook, uh, led growth at Facebook and then built the growth for and then was the uh, chief growth officer at uh, Lyft. I, I 100% agree with both. Perfect. Nadav, what resources have you found really valuable that you would recommend to listeners? Two uh, authors that I liked, I think, uh, and two specific books from each of them is uh, Nassim Taleb, Fooled by Randomness, uh, specifically, and, and Anti-Fragile. Those two, two specific books, I think, are, are great. Uh, they have taught me a lot, and um, I, I think it's uh, super interesting. And, and then a uh, more recent one is Annie Duke. Uh, two books that I like are Thinking in Bets and the new one, uh, Quit. Super, super, super <laughs> interesting perspective and applicable in both cases, I think both Antifragile from the same Talib and Quit from Annie Duke are very applicable for definitely for investors, but also for founders. 
And for anyone, any executive who's making decisions or any leader who's leading a team and trying to make decisions every day. Or if you enjoy some poker, it helps for that too. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any habits, tactics, or techniques that are a secret weapon? It actually, it actually connects to my other answer, but, but I, I will say authenticity goes a long way. Um, if you can keep it real, be overly transparent at times. People will, will respect that. They will trust you more. They will follow you and you will have good conversations. And finally, guys, what is the best way for listeners to connect with you and follow along with uh, each of your companies? Uh, yeah. So for us, uh, our name is our website URL. It's at dot inc, at inc, basically. So that's a good way to interact with us and follow us. And then uh, with me directly, it's mostly like I would say LinkedIn direct messages. I'm not a big Twitter <laughs> user or anything else. So LinkedIn would be the best way. With me, LinkedIn will be the best way. And yes, our website is honeybook.com. Okay. Well, there it is. Nadav and Oz, you know, thank you so much for the time today. And thanks for sharing this incredible story of HoneyBook. That will wrap up today's episode. Thanks for joining us here on the show. As always, show notes and links for the interview are at fullratchet.net. And until next time, remember to overprepare, choose carefully, and invest confidently. Thanks for joining us. 